Let's discuss the most terrifying players in this year's NFL draft. And look, these players have a ton of positive traits. They are very talented, but I'm still highly concerned. And we could start with the Oregon running back, Bucky Irvin, who probably terrifies me most. And I'm surprised to see that he's on plenty of people's top five running back lists for this draft. I personally don't have him in my top five or even my top 10. But before we get into why, let's discuss the positive traits about Irving. Because they clearly do exist. Irving is going to be an early declare. He spent three years in college, his first one at Minnesota. Fine season, seven rushing yards but then he transferred to Oregon which is where he really broke out and you can see right away in his first year 2022 he puts up over a thousand rushing yards he's averaging nearly seven yards per attempt you factor in his receiving game which is also pretty good 31 catches 299 receiving yards and things got even better in 2023 when Bucky Irving earned over 1400 total yards and more importantly 51 receptions which led every running back in the nation and as you can see PFF points out right here about Bucky Irving he comes in with the best two-year rushing grade among FBS running backs posting back back-to-back -back seasons with a 91 plus grade the takeaway is that nobody was better in college football the last two years according to pff rushing grades than bucky irving is best known for his great burst and balance he can make defenders missed he's an elite pass catcher and only had one fumble on 475 carries last year so now i'm building all these positive traits up so you might be wondering why is he on this terrifying prospects list well let me explain for starters he showed up to the nfl combine and measured in at 5'9 and 192 pounds now 192 pounds is not great I'm not going to hide it. At the wide receiver position, you can get away with being a little bit smaller these days. The running back position, it's still really tough, but we did see some guys do it just a year ago. Like Devon A. Chain for the Dolphins and Keaton Mitchell for the Ravens, who were both under 200 pounds in their rookie seasons and had a major impact in the NFL. But there's also a huge difference between those running backs and Bucky Irving, and that's speed. Because A. Chain, a former track star, ran a blazing 4-3-2 40 time, and Keontae Mitchell added a 4-3-7 40 time. Compared to Keaton Mitchell, who again was only 192 pounds and only ran a 455. I mean, this is what you would expect out of guys who are around 220, 225 pounds. He's 192 pounds. You can see right here, that's just 27th percentile speed. So he doesn't have size or speed. That's not great for the NFL. Because the ways that Devon Achan and Keontae Mitchell won last year was their speed. They were used in an offense that got them to the outside. And that's something that Bucky Irvin struggled to do in college. Besides those speed concerns, Bucky has shown on tape that he struggles to beat defenders to the outside and isn't much of a pass blocker. It's also worth mentioning that both Devon Achan Chan and Keontae Mitchell dealt with multiple injuries last season, including season ending injuries, which maybe it's just a coincidence or the fact that they're 100 to 200 pounds lighter than the defenders tackling them. The closest upside comparable that I can see for one Bucky Irving would be a smaller Theo Riddick. And if you remember Theo Riddick, he was like a satellite back at best, not really an impact for most teams or fantasy football. And the closest realistic comparable I can find when you factor in his size and his speed of being under 200 pounds running that 455 is Mark Walton. And yeah, nothing really happened with Mark Walton in the NFL. So I'm a bit concerned for Bucky Irving. I do, of course, wish him the best, but he's just not in my top 10 because he terrifies me. Now, the next man up is Audric Estime out of Notre Dame, and he's a younger prospect. At just 20 years old, he's the second youngest running back in this class and spent three seasons at Notre Dame. Now, Estime didn't play much as a freshman. He had just seven carries, but then the progressions of his game started in 2022, 920 yards. He's averaging like seven yards per carry. 2023, even more of a workload, 18 touchdowns, over 1,300 total yards. So you're getting this young prospect who got better every single year at college at a major program and honestly it gets even better because Estime is a bigger back at 221 pounds with quality pass protection skills for his age and he picks up yards after contact while rarely fumbling the ball look I love young prospects who produce at a major program but what I don't love is what Estime did at the NFL combine because the fella showed up at 221 pounds and he goes out there and runs a 471 40 time 471 is usually what you see out of guys who get drafted if they're lucky in the fifth round usually sixth seventh round don't even get drafted you can see it's 28th percentile I mean this is indeed a red flag and now I know what you might be thinking oh but at his pro day a few weeks later he went out there and ran a 458 40 time and I would say this would be really good if it was reliable and trustworthy but as I've stated in previous videos the pro day is just set up to be beneficial to that prospect it's at his school it's his coaches and personnel who are the ones clicking that stopwatch most of the time yeah there's a little bit of bias that's going to be baked in probably my guess is that estimate actually saw his 40 time at his pro day closer to that 4-7 then a 4-5-8 and that is still what terrifies me now look he is still young and can break tackles but here are some of the other concerns outside of being a slower back he's not a pass catcher he had just 26 catches across 28 college games and that means it's going to be harder to get on the field if you don't have that versatility which if you're somebody who plays fantasy or dynasty fantasy that's also a red flag his upside comparable entering the NFL would be somebody like Jordan Howard who was an NFL veteran he had a great rookie year of over 1300 rushing yards he was a little bit slower at the combine but after his first two seasons in the NFL 
tell he was just a grinder backup running back. But the concern is that Howard was an outlier out of that type of prospect, slower and bigger back. It's more likely that he turns into somebody like a Benny Snell or Wayne Gallman, who are guys that are playing in like the UFL now. So I am concerned that he only becomes a short yardage back in the NFL, maybe a bit of a backup, which concerns me, but I do hope he proves me wrong. Next up, we transition to a wide receiver who I saw a lot of comments about on my previous videos where Xavier Leggett in the top 10 wide receivers. He wasn't in that video, at least not yet, because he does terrify me. Look, there's a lot of reasons to like Leggett. You can see right here. He actually spent five seasons at South Carolina, only four are listed here. And in his fifth year, he had a massive season, 71 catches, over 1,200 yards, 17.7 yards per catch. This was a breakout. He ranked 12th amongst all college receivers last year in yards per route run. And Leggett's a bigger wide receiver at 221 pounds. He uses his size to his advantage. He's a contested catch monster who creates yards after the catch. And things only got better for his stock. It has risen dramatically after he attended the NFL Combine. We're at 221 pounds, so a bigger receiver. He still ran in the four threes. A four three nine. that's 98th percentile. He also shows great burst, 89th percentile burst. But of course, since he's in this video, that means he has some major concerns that do terrify me. The first one is glaring, and it's that he didn't have any college production until his fifth year at South Carolina. As Kyle Dvorak points out here, Leggett would be only the second wide receiver since 2000 to have fewer than 500 total receiving yards after four seasons, and the other was Vilas Jones, who didn't pan out in the NFL. To be exact, he only had 432 yards, so barely 100 yards a season his first four years of college. What gives? And a few more concerns, as you can see in this PFF article right here, was that he had an up and down senior bowl, and I would actually argue that it was more of a down than an up. He didn't win the weigh-ins when he measured in at just six foot one instead of people saying he was six foot three and six foot four, and he had shorter arms and smaller hands than expected, which matters when you're a jump ball receiver. So all of these are concerns. So how can we start to explain it away? The late breakout, because the breakout was great. Well, there's honestly a couple of major ways. The first one makes me gutted, and it's the fact that he lost both of his parents before he even graduated. One was in ninth grade, one was right before he graduated high school. So that's something that's going to be weighing on you. Yeah, that probably affects your first couple of years of college and just developing as a person, a man without your parents. And another underreported incident was that Leggett was in a motorcycle accident during his college career, which of course is going to impact you. And he is a fifth year senior, but you factor in that 2020, the COVID year, there weren't really games. Not a lot of teams were even playing in general. So that's kind of a wash. So when we factor in all this context, I'm getting closer to being in the camp that Leggett is a fine prospect. And a lot of this has to do with his elite testing numbers and that fifth year breakout. It doesn't mean I like him in the first round or the second round. He's more of a third round receiver for me. And if that's where he goes, I think he's a value for that team. And maybe he starts to become a sleeper for your dynasty fantasy football leagues. But I do get a little bit worried when I look at some of the player comparables like a JJ or Sega Whiteside or a Jonathan Mingo. But to be fair, this final year for Leggett was a much better year than either of those guys had in college. Now, this next one might seem strange because if you watched our ranking the 10 best wide receivers in this draft class, this guy, Adonai Mitchell from Texas, actually pops up on that list and he's pretty high up on it. Now, there is a reason he was that high and we talked about it in that video and we'll get into it a little bit here, but there's also reasons why he terrifies me. Mitchell played at Georgia next to plenty of other future NFL pass catchers in this class like Brock Bowers, Lad McConkey, and Jermaine Burton for his first two college seasons. And then after those two seasons, a 2022 year that dealt with injury and didn't play a full season, just five games, he transferred to Texas in 2023, where he had his best college year, 55 catches and 845 receiving yards. He also led the SEC with 11 touchdowns that year. Quinn Ewers, a Texas quarterback, trusted him a lot downfield and in the red zone. Now, the awesome part of Adonai Mitchell's game are indeed just that, awesome. Mitchell is an early declare at 21 years old, and he possesses deep speed and elite ball tracking traits. When you watch his film, you'll see him almost effortlessly stride by defensive backs at times. The guy can separate, has elite body control, and runs great routes. His highs are super high. And then Adonai shows up to the NFL Combine and at 205 pounds, 6 foot 2, runs a 4 3 4 40 time. Just the third player ever to do that. One of those guys, DK Metcalf, the other guy, another prospect in this class who's a top 5 wide receiver, in my opinion, Brian Thomas. So these are the traits and abilities and parts to his profile that landed him in that video and in my top 10 wide receiver rankings. But guys, I can't lie, I'm still terrified. His yards after the catch and efficiency are a concern and his college production profile doesn't match up with your typical successful NFL receiver. He only posted 1,405 yards in his three-year college career when some prospects have done that last year alone. Now, of course, there are some reasons we can state for this. In 2021, there was elite competition at Georgia. In 2022, he was injured. And then in 2023, he transferred to a new offense with a new quarterback and had a fight next to Xavier Worthy for targets. These would all be valid excuses and some more than others, but that's what they would be. They would be excuses for every single year why he didn't produce. At some point, you have to say, hey, was it Mitchell himself? So that's the part that terrifies me. Why couldn't he break out at either of these elite programs? And then there's also some murmurs out there that he doesn't really go all out on his routes on film. Touching on a player's effort is always a tricky situation, so I don't really want to dive too deep down that rabbit hole, especially since Adonai Mitchell has addressed this and said that that's just part
part of his game, changing the pacing of his routes. But the production is an overall concern. You can see right here, according to PFF, Adonai Mitchell stands out as a potential first round wide receiver in this grouping, who also had one of the lowest differences in his career yards per route run versus expected yards per route run. Now that's a bunch of words and math mumbo jumbo, but what it translates to is based on the situations he was in, he did not excel all that much. And here's another stat that's concerning. Mitchell's numbers after the catch were particularly poor, including one of the worst yards after the catch per receptions figures of any wide receiver since 2019. So this makes Adonai Mitchell more of a projection than it might actually seem based on where he's in a lot of top five and top 10 wide receiver rankings. Admittedly, I'm still a fan, but I'm terrified. And just a quick reminder, if you're not subscribed to this channel, we are so close to 100,000 subscribers. If you enjoy this content and want to see more of it, just hit that subscribe button. Next up, we go to a small school running back in Isaiah Davis, who I'm intrigued by, but I can't lie, he also terrifies me and here's why. So Davis spent four seasons at South Dakota State, where honestly, he was productive every single year. All four years, he had at least 700 rushing yards and he broke out in 2022 in a major way with almost 1,500 rushing yards, 15 touchdowns. And then he factored in his receiving game, pretty good. 21 catches, almost 200 yards. So he had nearly 1,700 total yards. And then he follows this up in 2023 with almost 1,600 rushing yards when you factor in the receiving yards, over 1,700 total yards and 12 touchdowns. Believe it or not, Davis was the number one graded runner in all of college football last season. I was a bit surprised to see Isaiah Davis ranked number one in running back grades by PFF, but then you start to look into his profile and it's not as shocking. Davis has legit size at 220 pounds and is a true workhorse back who doesn't fumble the football and ranked fourth in broken tackles last season. He just does all the fundamentals right at the running back position and then he showed up to the NFL combine and was faster than expected for his size running a 4 5 7 40 time. But he's in this video so yeah he terrifies me for a few reasons. He posted all of his production in the FCS at a smaller program in South Dakota State against much weaker competition and he also doesn't stand out from an explosiveness standpoint. Davis doesn't have great bursts and he's not much of a pass catcher earning just 50 three catches in 46 college games despite that weaker competition. But this is the piece of the puzzle that I can't stop thinking about. Over 700 rushing yards every year. In his first two years, he was competing with future NFL running back and now current NFL running back Pierre Strong, and he still had 700 yards and over 800 yards, averaging eight yards per carry in each of these seasons and 100 touches per year. The small school production and lack of explosiveness definitely scares me, but when we consider that he's going to be a later round draft pick for both real life and your fantasy leagues, it makes it less terrifying. There's just not as much risk at that point and his player comparable in the NFL is honestly not that bad. It's the Atlanta Falcons running back Tyler Algier who sure he was drafted to an ideal situation for at the time a run heavy offense in the Atlanta Falcons. But there's also a decent chance that a similar type of a team looks at Davis and says you'll fit our scheme and that he lands in an ideal spot. The next player up is Brendan Rice and if you don't already know this is Jerry Rice's son. Yes the legend Jerry Rice and his son Brendan is currently projected as you can see right here on Mock Draft, Dat Mock Draft Database to go in the third round the 86th overall player at the wide receiver position and compared to other guys in that range, Rice does terrify me. Rice spent four years in college, his first two at Colorado, before transferring to USC for his final two seasons where he saw more playing time. And this is also where he saw more production, his first year in 2022 at USC, 611 yards, and then that increased his final year, 45 catches and 791 yards. Now, Rice is a downfield receiver, and as you can see on PFF right here, he actually ranks top 10 in this class in average depth of target. His yards per reception were also nice at over 17. Brendan Rice, average depth of target. The average target downfield for him, over 40. 14 yards downfield. And the positives to his game might seem kind of obvious when you consider that his dad is Jerry Rice. His football IQ is levels above most prospects. He knows how to run routes, win at the line of scrimmage, and get separation. So this is all great and fantastic, but the problem is it never consistently translated to the field. Rice failed to have a major breakout college season, and this is especially concerning when we considered he played in one of the top offenses in the country the last two years with stud quarterback Caleb Williams. Now to be fair, in 2022, he did play next to Jordan Addison, who ended up being a first round pick. Pick. But in 2023, he still failed to have a massive breakout season. He still played by good wide receivers in Taj Washington and Mario Williams, but he should have had a breakout if he's going to go this high. The concerns for Rice are his production background, his overall speed, and a lack of physicality. And despite working as a downfield receiver for a lot of last year, he only won three contested catches, ranking 290th in the entire country. Now, he showed up to the NFL Combine and he ran a 4-5. For at his size, that was well above average, but it wasn't anything elite. It wasn't in the 4-4s, the low 4-4s, or even the 4-3s, which would have definitely helped his stock as sort of a middling pick in this year's draft, a third or a fourth round pick. So Rice will probably go in round three. And the upsides are that, yeah, Jerry Rice is his dad and that's translated into his football IQ, but we just haven't seen it in the production background. And that does terrify me. Now, before we get to the guy who terrifies me the most in this entire draft class, I want to let you know about the fantasy blueprint. If you play fantasy football, which you probably do, and you want to win your league, this is for you because this blueprint will help you do exactly that. Whether it's your dynasty league, your season long league, or every single week during the season, once the fall comes, this will help you to get the blueprint you just follow these two simple
simple steps right here it's ten dollars for the entire year but here's the big point if you don't make your fantasy playoffs i just refund that 10 bucks and this is a limited time offer before the summer begins is when you can get this risk-free promotion so if you're interested at all you might as well sign up right now and you can do so with the link in the description or just scanning the qr code on the screen to get access to your fantasy blueprint right now and i will send you the first version once it drops now the guy who terrifies me the most in this entire draft class is keon coleman and like adonai mitchell he was indeed in that top 10 wide receivers video that i made a couple weeks back now i mentioned in that video coleman is likely to be a boomer bust prospect depending on his landing spot because he has all the talent in the world as a 20 year old early declare he's a great contested catch player and can beat man coverage thanks to his size power and explosiveness coleman just plays the game violently and has some of the most reliable hands in the class which we like for a brief background he spent his first two years at michigan state where in his final year there 2022 he put up a career high 798 yards and outproduced Jaden reed who just had a great rookie year for the packers then in 2023 he transfers to florida state they go undefeated and he leads the team in both receptions with 50 and yards with 658 but what terrifies me about coleman is that he never had a massive college year or even a breakout season now maybe this is due to the more run heavy nature of his programs in michigan state and florida state but even when you break it down on a per team passing play basis he was still an average college producer and now a lot of people have made a big fuss about his 46140 time which is slow but for his size around 215 pounds it's actually above average and then his gauntlet drill time his gps speed was one of the best in this draft class which just shows that his real game speed is still strong so i'm not as much worried about his speed but the overall athleticism is somewhat of a concern for a guy who relies on jump ball ability and just couldn't even break out at two major programs but when i watch his film there are a couple of clear reasons as to maybe why this happened florida state used him on special teams as a returner and in the screen game and for a guy who's a bigger contested catch guy with not a lot of quick twitch to him that's just kind of improper coaching and maybe impacted his overall career and ability to break out so maybe it just was the inadequate coaching and using him in the wrong role and if he actually lands in the end of the first round that's even more added incentive financially for a team to make sure he's in the right role in the nfl but if he does fall into the middle to end of round two that's where i'd start to get a little bit more concerned about his upside for your team there's just less incentive to keep him out on the field if he's not producing and your fantasy team so these are the players that terrify me in this nfl draft and i do like some of them but i have to admit there are parts of their game that terrify me now if you want to see the players that i believe are the best kept secrets and there's six of them in this nfl draft well check out this video that we released earlier in the week right over here